Hello and welcome to this CIS health testing webinar. This is number three in the series and today we're going to be talking about IBR and the testing involved with managing IBR in a dairy herd. Um, as a brief reminder, my name is Dan Humphreys, I'm a dairy vet with Horizon Dairy Vets, but as well as the clinical work, we also provide some of the consultancy and support services to CIS in their health testing programmes. But without further ado, let's get stuck in. So IBR, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis. So we're actually talking about bovine herpes virus one, of which IBR is the most common presentation of it. Um, many of you will be familiar with IBR. Hopefully you haven't seen too much of it, but those pictures of streaming eyes and streaming noses shouldn't be too uncommon to you. We aren't going to actually um, talk about the clinical signs or things like that much today. There are loads of really good resources out there. The picture is from uh, nadis.org.uk and that's a really good site where you can find out a bit more about the disease if you want to. But some of the key points about IBR is that infection is lifelong. That's one that's worth knowing. That herpes virus, it basically, once it's in there, it stays in there, but it can go dormant for quite a bit of time. But it is often like reawakened or recrudesces in periods of stress so they can start shedding the virus again and infect their colleagues. Of interest is the UK herd prevalence is, is really quite high and it depends on the kind of uh, which um, survey you look at and which herd types you look at. But the, the estimates are between about 43 and 84% of UK herds have IBR circulating within them which is massive, which is really quite large. And we do actually lag quite a long way behind uh, a good few EU countries now in um, controlling bovine herpes virus. Um, and it started to present us with some challenges from the trade point of view and for things like showing because we can't really get UK animals into some countries of Europe. So I'm talking areas of Italy, Germany, Belgium, all of Scandinavia, they've all, they've, embarked on IBR control programs or BHV control pr programs and are now way down the track and some have completely eradicated it from their herds. Not an easy thing to do and just to put a little bit of kind of a, a scale on that is those um, a lot of those control programs started in the 1980s and they're just yielding the results now. So we have a long way to go. Before we get stuck into IBR particularly, this is a quick refresher which will be relevant for today. Um, when we're testing for an infectious disease, there are two kind of routes we can take. We can look for the virus or the bacteria itself, or more specifically, we look for antigens of those of the virus or bacteria. And those antigens are components of that virus or bacteria. They're just little fragments that we can hunt out. And if they're present, we know the virus or bacteria is present. The other option we've got is we can look for evidence of exposure to that virus. So we're looking for an immune response from the host animal. So we're looking for an immune response from the cans. And one of those major components of an immune response is the production of antibodies. Um, and those antibodies then can come from wild virus exposure to the actual disease, or they can come from a vaccine. And this is where we start to get a little bit clever because IBR marker vaccines exist. And so the technology in a marker vaccine is that you modify the actual virus in the vaccine to be slightly different from the one that's circulating as a wild virus. And in this case, you'll hear them referred to as GE deleted. So GE is a particular antigen, a particular component of the virus, which they've deleted in this vaccine virus. Before we carry on, there are a couple of um, little points to remember. Not all IBR vaccines are marker vaccines. That's a key point. Only some of them are. The ones that are marker vaccines are often labelled as marker vaccines. Vaccines can also be live or inactivated, so live or dead. And also you get some vaccines the way you can use the different routes of administration, so intramuscular and intranasal. So there's quite a few combinations um, a vaccine available and how you use it can be different. So before we really carry on with this, it's well worth checking with your vet, which is the most suitable for your herd, because a lot of the herd demographics, what you're trying to achieve and in what circumstance you're in will alter which vaccine you choose. But remember, not all IBR vaccines are marker vaccines. But 
why are marker vaccines good then? Because they allow divas or the differentiation of infected and vaccinated animals. So typically with a lot of disease testing, when we're looking for antibodies, we don't actually know where those antibodies have come from. And as soon as we vaccinate for that disease, it can actually be then very difficult to tell which of these animals has got antibodies because they were vaccinated and which of these animals have got antibodies because actually they've seen the virus or got the virus in the case of um, IBR when it's a lifelong infection they could be continually infected. So by deleting that small component we know that if we start looking for that GE antigen or antibodies to that GE antigen, that, that GE component of the virus, we know that that's not come from our marker vaccine because the marker vaccine doesn't have that part in it. So we can look amongst this group of cows and actually tell who's seen the, the real wild virus and who's just got antibodies because they've been exposed to the vaccine, which is obviously very, very useful. And it does mean that we can actually use vaccines really well in the, as a control mechanism and still carry on with herd surveillance. And now IBR surveillance, how does it change? So there is bulk milk testing available for IBR uh, surveillance. Um, and as just discussed, we can actually look for IBR antibodies or we can look for IBR GE antibodies. So that will be dependent on whether, which, whether you use a marker vaccine or you don't. Bulk milk testing and bulk milk surveillance is great for monitoring over time. And so we can actually track those trends and you can look on the graph what those antibody levels are over a period of time. And if we start to see things increase, we can be fairly confident that IBR is circulating within the herd. There is uh, more animals are, or, or animals are certainly making more antibodies to IBR. And if it's um, we're looking for the wild virus, then that might be it. However, bulk milk testing does have its limits with IBR testing. It's not actually sensitive enough to confirm that your herd is completely negative of IBR. The sensitivity also decreases with herd size. So as soon as herds start getting bigger above two, three, four hundred cows, this, this test becomes less sensitive. What I mean by that is that we may well be diluting some of the antibodies out effectively with just more and more milk. And as such, we can't say a negative test on a bulk test is actually good enough to say this herd is IBR negative. However, a positive is a significant result because if we're finding antibodies, then they are there. So um, we know that a positive is a positive. If you are in a situation where you, you're testing the bulk tank and you get repeated negatives, you might think, OK, I'm quite confident that my herd status is looking quite good. There's certainly not a big problem at the moment. Is it worth further testing? And we can do individual animal testing. Again, differentiating between IBR as its full components or the IBR GE antibodies. So the antibodies to that um, to the wild virus. And you can do that with milk or blood samples. Obviously, with the milk samples, we've got a massive element, element of convenience there. Um, we can actually do that as part of a routine management process. So, IBR. Firstly, it's really important to know your herd status. And so these surveillance and monitoring schemes help that. It's also incredibly important to know the status of any incoming stock, because if you are a naive herd and there isn't any uh, immunity around and you bring IBR into the herd, you can have pretty dramatic consequences. Choosing the right test for IBR does require knowledge of what your management strategy is. Um, so that's why it can be uh, a little bit complicated. And that's why you sometimes see various different IBR tests listed is because it depends what we're doing as to which is the best test. So if you're vaccinating with a marker vaccine, we need to be using one of the tests that is designed to be used with a marker vaccine. If we're not using a marker vaccine, then again, we won't actually be able to differentiate from those animals from infected animals. And if we're not using any vaccine whatsoever, then either test will show us whether there is virus around. These tests 
can be used as part of a framework. And these frameworks uh, exist for herd certification. So checks would be the one you most uh, commonly see. Um, but there's a certain, um, on the checks websites, you'll see a plan and the testing schedule for what you need to actually get different levels of certification from being completely negative to vaccinated and negative through to actually ongoing with a bit of a problem. But solution or getting to a place where we've got IBR under control, it's easier to start now than at any other point. So that's that for that. Just a quick blast through IBR testing. Obviously, if you have any more questions, um, then feel free to contact us. You can call your CIS area manager. There is an interactive map on the website, which, um, which is very handy. And you can just click through your little counties and find out who, who you are supposed to be speaking to. Alternatively, feel free to get in touch with head office. The phone number's there. And there's the, uh, the email address and, of course, social media.